Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 98 of the American Muslim Experience, and we are inching towards our 100th episode. But as always, I am joined by my co-host, Omar Ansari. Omar? Hey, Sonic and Perez. Sonic and everyone. How you doing? Sound good, good, good. Good to have you back. Good to be back with you. Um... Um, I wanted to, before we bring on, on the, bring on the guest and introduce our, our guest, because we are both excited for this conversation um, and we want to be sort of mindful of time and so on. I, I did want to kind of situate us in terms of where we are in terms of the time and when we're recording. Um, we are recording the day after Ashura, which is the uh, 10th of Muharram. Muharram, of course, being among many other things, and we'll get into this um, hopefully during the uh, during the. Uh, the uh, during the conversation, but uh, is among many things the start of the Muslim New Year um, for um, listeners uh, of, of all faiths. So yeah, the Muharram is the beginning of the of the Muslim calendar, the beginning of the New Year for for the Muslim uh, uh, Hijri calendar or the calendar that commemorates uh, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him's migration to uh, from Mecca to Medina. So um, that's where we are, and uh, we are also uh, days after, I think, uh, this news broke on Friday, uh, uh, something that uh, Omar and I were reflecting on offline, but I thought we'd at least mention it online or on the, uh, on the show, which is the, um, the death of uh, Chadwick Boseman, who played uh, famously, among many other uh, roles that he was famous for, um, Black Panther. And so, Omar, I, I know you and I were kind of texting back and forth about it, but um, obviously a shock had been suffering from colon cancer for uh, four years, um, uh, of which which if you just kind of look at the scope of the roles that at least I think you and I and perhaps a lot of our listeners are familiar with, whether it's Black Panther and the various MCU movies, but also, you know, uh, the uh, Marshall, the Thurgood Marshall story, um, uh, the Duff Five Blo- Bloods, which is the latest Spike Lee movie. Um, those were all post, you know, uh, post uh, while he's being treated for colon cancer. It's sort of unbelievable when you think about it. Yeah, and he, he also played. Who's the guy who did the uh, uh, Living in America? The Rocky. Oh uh, yeah, he, he played. He, yeah, it was um, Get On Up, which was the story of James Brown. James Brown. And he also did another biopic, but I think that was early on, earlier in his career. I should say, very short career in general. But that was uh, where he played Jackie Robinson uh, in '42. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, yesterday or Friday was Jackie Robinson Day. Uh, which sort of the uh, baseball's commemoration of that of uh, of Jackie Robinson, the first Black American baseball player. Yeah, I mean the, he was a In great actor, great actor, and he and he kept picking these roles that really instilled pride. In, in, in the African-American community. I mean, some of the roles went beyond, obviously, Black Panther and whatnot, and all his movies were good. But just in terms of, like, he was intentionally picking these roles that just had really positive impact and instilled pride. And and I think um, that was, that was one, that's one of the reasons why his, his passing is really, really being felt. But, yeah, you texted me, as you, you tend to do sometimes when there's – um, interesting news or or comic book news when I text you back, right? Yeah. But uh, this is kind of both. But yeah, real sad. Um, yesterday, obviously, social media was flooded. This morning, interestingly enough, I saw two related posts, and both were about uh, whether or not you can say uh, or, uh, "rest in peace." Uh, that that was that was an interesting one. Uh, one view uh, on each on each uh, on each uh, uh, one 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 post on each viewpoint. Uh, so it's interesting how now it's gone to the Muslim Twitter side of things and, and and that's what i'm hearing but yeah just overall definitely a sad situation it's yeah i mean something we've touched on in the past on the show which is just talking about how anytime there's a death of, a, of a, like a celebrity i think this happened back in back when like when prince died and kobe died it died there's always this sort of discussion online among muslims about how muslims are supposed to grieve and you can say this and you can't say that and you can feel this and you can't feel that and we've had our commentary about it but Anyway, I don't want to. I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to delay bringing on yeah. our guests. But yeah. Um. Uh. Anyway, we are super excited uh, to have some, uh, someone. Someone I've, I've wanted to have on the show for a really long time, and I think it's sort of timely because we do want to talk about um, the Shi'i tradition, and that is. And I sort of bury. I was going to bury the lead, but I didn't. Um. Our guest for for, for the show is David Coolidge. Um, David Coolidge was born in Chicago, raised in Kenilworth, Illinois, which is a suburb on the north side. 
He has a BA from Brown University and an MA from Princeton University. Uh, David converted to Islam in 1998. From uh, 2008 to 2013, he worked as a Muslim chaplain, first at Dartmouth College, and then again at his alma mater of Brown. Um, he also served on the board uh, boards of various Muslim organizations, among which uh, are Talif Collective, where Dave and I uh, were both on the board together, and primarily where I know David from, although uh, we actually met for the first time before that, which I'll tease just, or I'll tease for now, and I'll mention a little bit later. Uh, from 2014 to 2017, oh, and he also served on the board of Zaytuna College. Um, and then finally, from 2014 to 2017, he taught undergraduate courses on Islamic law and ethics at NYU, uh, New York University. And presently, he is right here in Berkeley, where he is pursuing a PhD at the Graduate Theological Union, where his focus is on Muslim perceptions of Hindu tradition. Um, thank you, David, for being on the show, and thank you for sitting there quietly while we kind of uh, 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 waxed poetically about something and then also read through that bio of yours. So anyway, welcome welcome to Diffuse Congruence. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's, a, it's a real honor. Yeah, it's great to have you. And, and something that I teased and I, and I do want to mention um, was where you and I actually first met. And it's kind of funny because, or it's interesting because the story does connect to a previous guest. So the um, uh, first time I ever met David uh, was actually in the summer of 2002. Um, I had just moved to Michigan uh, to actually pursue my MA in Islamic studies. Um, and so I was I just moved to Michigan. We were expecting our firstborn. So I had a wife at home who was super pregnant. Um, we had just moved from a completely different, or first time for my wife to move anywhere outside of Texas, uh, in fact, outside of a zip code. Um, and for me, you know, it was obviously a big move as well. But uh, there I was in Michigan. And uh, David and I met for the first time at a program called the Alisan program, which was actually uh, also uh, in conjunction with the Alim program. It was the same folks that bring us Alim, the American Learning Institute for Muslims. We're also doing a language intensive program. Um, and so at that time, David uh, was one of the few Alisan program attendees. I think there was like maybe half a dozen or so. Um, and you were roommates with Farhan Sayed, local Bay Area um, mini celebrity. <laughs> Farhan listens, so I'm just kind of teasing him. Um, and then uh, in the connection to a previous guest that I was teasing was that um, we've also had Essen Uncle, uh, Essen Sayed, who was um, one of the people featured in our Immigrant Stories uh, uh, um, episode. And uh, we are delighted to have him on the show. And so there is a connection between David and a previous guest, although, although there is certainly a connection to other previous guests we've had as well. But anyway, David, great to have you back. Great, or great to have you on the show. Good to connect this way. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, I... I remember you as a graduate student studying under Imam Munir Farid, yeah. you know, who was a big influence on my life, um, gave me some fundamental pieces of advice in my spiritual journey that defined me in many respects, um, mm. and someone who was you know, very honest uh, about our tradition and about the complexities of our tradition and about the choices that we make as Muslims, uh, to emphasize certain things or de-emphasize others, and always an interlocutor that I greatly respected. Um, and uh, so I pretty much figured that if you were his student, you were pretty smart, mashallah. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I was about to be his student officially, so um, when you met me. But uh, yeah, thank you for that. And of course, Dr. Munir Farid is a, is a guest who we've had on the show in, 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 you know prior um, so David, I mean, I guess you've already kind of talked about, I guess, where you were in 2002 and, 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 uh, um, uh, you know, like when, when you and I met, but if you could maybe kind of take us back, uh, take us back to growing up in, um, Kenilworth, Illinois, which is a suburb on the North side, um, uh, maybe talk a little bit about that. And then I, I think Omar and I will kind of try to steer the conversation into, uh, into areas, I think of your very unique background that we want to focus on. Okay, sure. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. To God, please bless Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. Um, for anyone who's listening, assalamu alaikum. May peace be upon you. 
so yeah, I grew up in this town called Kenilworth, um, which is, I sometimes describe as like Kuwait, uh, cause it's like this little thing on the, on Lake Michigan that was carved out of two larger suburbs, which would in this analogy be Iraq and Saudi Arabia. <laughs> um, and it was actually, you know, created by a business person from downtown Chicago, who was a Swedenborgian. Uh, who just bought this big farm basically and wanted to create his like ideal community. Uh Um, And so when they built a church in our town, Kenilworth Union Church, it was intentionally non-denominational. He wasn't going to push his Swedenborgian interpretation of Christianity, but I think that obviously he wanted to be included alongside whatever, whoever else was there at the time, Presbyterians or, so on and so forth. The only other church in town is the Episcopal Church right across the street because obviously Episcop- Episcopalians are, are distinctive, right? They don't just go to any other church. Mm-hmm. Um, so, what were the uh, what were the two suburbs that it was carved out of? Sorry, I'm trying to place it uh, you know, Wilmette, Wilmette and Winnetka. That's right. I thought so. And is this, is this like a small town uh, growing so up? Yeah, so town because town? it's so small, it is a K through 8 school just for that community. Um, and so that's where I went to school until I went to the local public high school. And, you know, I would describe it as like a, a small town upbringing, even though we were technically only, you know, 15 minutes from the northern border of the city of Chicago by car. Mm-hmm. You know, we would have massive games of capture the flag across like, you know, multiple blocks of, you know, so it'd be one person's house would be one base, another person's house would be another base, and it'd be like, running through the streets and running behind people's houses. And, the, you know, we would ride our bikes to the beach and, you know, go swimming. And, and we had one kind of athletic field where I learned to play baseball. I learned to play football. You know, we had a local football team called the Kenilworth Rebels, which was started by these old guys who had been like, some of them had been ex-NFL. And they just wanted to teach the local kids football because the school didn't have a football program. So through sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, I played football and I loved it. Um, and, uh, you know, they would say things like, if I, if I yell at you, it means that I care. If I don't say anything to you, I've given up on you. <laughs> so like all these like old, tough, probably some of them were ex-military. <laughs> I don't know. Looking at you, and, I would have thought ba- uh, basketball as opposed to football. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you're just tall. Yeah, you, yeah. yeah, we played basketball in the gymnasium Got behind it. the school and yeah. did stick ball, you know. So I honestly, well, Lahi, I sometimes think about it, and I think it was just this dream because mm-hmm. it was this so, such a American, typical baseball and apple pie upbringing. Um, and, you know, I could talk about that for a whole show, but mm-hmm. I think since we're talking about religion specifically, I'll just say that um, the best description that I've found uh, of my church growing up, uh, it was in an academic article. Um, I think the book is called, it's in a book called Liv- Lived Religion in America. It, the, the scholar calls it golden rule Christianity. And and so I, I would always describe it as, Jesus is a good guy, so you should be a good guy too. Um, And so when I was growing up, I had no problem going to church. I enjoyed it. I would go on the church, you know, um, retreats and everything and Sunday school. But when they gave me the creed to say, um, because in our church, you were baptized as an infant, uh, but then you had to confirm your Christianity. You had to publicly declare it. Um, That was the sort of theology that underlied underlie these rituals so we had to i think it was seventh grade declare you know our belief and they gave us either the nicene creed or the apostles creed which are the two most famous creedal statements in christian tradition and i just couldn't say it um you know and i was not philosophical really before that and i this is one of those examples where i really i i Qadr to me is not a theoretical discussion. It's like something I've lived. I don't know why I couldn't say it. I went to my minister and I went to my parents and we talked about it. And me and my sister actually had a debate once where she said, oh, you were always really like philosophical. I said, no, I wasn't. Up Up until that moment and then a subsequent moment that happened, I was just like baseball, skateboarding, girls, you know, 
NWA and Guns N' Roses, you know, and I'm uh, laughing because every just Barbez knows I grew up in exactly the same experience and literally like word for word. So I'm just going to listen and, and reminisce while you talk. That's awesome. Um, so, I mean, David, uh, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I do appreciate you steering the conversation into some of your kind of religious background and I, and, and, uh, I don't mean to cut you off. I do want to sort of definitely come back to that. Um, you know, I, I think growing up in, in, in Kenilworth, um, uh, certainly I think not only the suburb itself or, um, you know, it's predominantly sort of affluent sort of white suburb, would you agree with that characterization? Um, one, and then number two, I mean, you know, uh, your family name. I mean, you're, you're Robert David Coolidge the third. And, and so that's always fascinated me because I know that you do have a relationship and the Coolidge name is not just accidental. Um, it, it, it also connects to, uh, you know, past president Calvin Coolidge. Um, so maybe kind of talk a little bit about your family background in terms of, you know, like what, how long were they in, 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 in Illinois? Um, you know, and then kind of obviously your, your parents role in maybe early Kenilworth, if anything. Yeah, so just to clarify, I'm not a third. Oh, I'm Robert's sorry. A third, and they one of the reasons they chose Robert as my first name. We have a, a I don't know where the why the tradition is, but yeah. me, my father, my grandfather, my great grandfather all go by David, but it's all our middle name. Mm. Um, and so my father chose Robert as my first name, which is my maternal grandfather's name. Uh, Rahmatullahi alayhi, may Allah have mercy on him, and. Uh, and we can talk about praying for dead Christians later if you want. Oh, thank you, please. Um, yeah, I think that uh, considering so, that we, what we what we talked about with Chadwick Boseman, yeah, that'd be a great conversation. Um, but just to, just very briefly, uh, mm -hmm. my marja, my you know the scholar whose legal rulings I follow, considers it permissible to pray for dead Christians um, and efficacious to send you know rewards to them in the barzakh, the inter intermediary world between this world and, and the day of resurrection by giving charity, sadaqah, by reciting the Quran, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Um, so anyways, uh, so my maternal grandfather's name was Robert. So they thought, my dad thought, oh, having my son named the fourth would be a little bit pretentious. So in addition to honoring my maternal lineage, <laughs> it also saved me from having a, you know, a little bit too snooty of a name. Okay. Uh, but all right, so I was wrong. I was I was remiss then in, in saying you were the third of anything. But um, yeah, you would have been technically the fourth. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. <laughs> and the, funny, the funny thing is, uh, we were joking before the show about uh, are you Dave versus David, and you can definitely uh, re repeat that because I thought that was that was great. But this uh, this is also a very Indian thing, right? To use like totally. a, a, kind of, a middle name as 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 what you go by. Yeah, like, and in fact, even in Urdu, like in Arabic, we say kunya. In Urdu, you say kunyat, uh, or the gharkanam, which is kind of like the more uh, sort of vernacular or colloquial way of describing what is essentially a name that is, you know, something something that is used by friends and family. Um, and oftentimes, you know, you, your father, your grandfather will all have the same uh, first and last name, but the middle name will be different, and hence you'll be actually called by your middle name. Um, and so in your case, it's slightly different, but you know, like in my mom and my mother's side, my maternal side, all of the men in the family are Haja something Vase. And so Haja is the first name, which is almost like an honorific name, actually an honorific title in South Asian culture or in culture, in Muslim culture. And then Vase is kind of technically the last name. However, it's really their middle name is what they're known by. And so... Uh, very interesting, and similar similar thing in my in my wife's family as well, where all, where all the men are near something Ali Khan, um, and we've actually had on the show uh, my brother in law, who's a physician pulmonologist, who's Doctor Mir Ali Khan, but it, everyone knows him as Doctor Mir Ali Khan outside of the home, but friends and family know him as his middle name. So anyway, sorry, David. So yeah, that is very something I'm sure that you picked up on being that you are also married into a, the, a, the South Indian tradition by way of your wife. Yeah, so my wife's parents uh, immigrated from the Bombay area um, in the 60s uh, and were part of, you know, the building out of the Muslim Students Association. Uh, so, rahmatullahi alayhima, may Allah have mercy on both of them, uh, Nishat and Shafi Babale. 
I mean, I mean, um, and you know, uh, it's interesting. You know, we our last guest, whose show that you follow, David, is uh, Amr Rahimullah, who the Rahimullah family and your wife's family, the Balbay family, very close family friends. Um, and in fact, I yeah, I, I met a lot of your wife's extended family, uh, the Balbay family, who were in Michigan. Uh, wonderful family in Canton, actually, where I lived. Um, and uh, so anyway, yeah, uh, you know, God bless your both of your in-laws who have, who have since passed on. But uh, I think I only met your mother-in-law, uh, not your father-in-law, if I if I recall. But anyway, that was a long time ago. Um, and yes, Probably but, because my, my father-in-law yeah. passed uh, when my wife was young of, yeah. of ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. That's right. Um, right. And um, so I never met him. That's right. Uh, I've only heard stories him in the next life, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Yeah, I've only heard stories uh, through, again, like I said, the Rahimullah family, uh, just wonderful stories. So, um, so bringing us back to your family, yeah, you were you were mentioning, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I did mention it, and so not to be Let me curious. say the story about uh, the yeah. name David. David, and Dave, had, yeah, Dave. Was that, uh, you know, so I went to visit the extended family in the, in the Mumbai area. Um, you know, some are in Mumbai, some are in this town on, on the outskirts called Biwandi. And uh, I introduced myself as Dave, and I kept getting these strange looks, and I didn't know what was going on. And then finally, after a couple of days, someone took me aside and said, you do realize that Dave means God. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, you can call me David. <laughs> So before that, people always just said, do you prefer Dave or David? I said, I don't care. But ever sub subsequent to that, I always say David. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, that's funny. Thank you um, for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, I don't want to leave the, uh, the listeners hanging. Um, you do have a family connection to uh, the president, Calvin Coolidge. Yeah. So, um, you know, my father is very interested in our our family history and heritage. Uh, he was just showing me this book that was published in 1930. That it was all about the descendants of John and Mary Coolidge, who came from England in 1630 and settled in Watertown, Massachusetts. Uh, and I visited their graves um, uh, at the old Watertown Cemetery. And there's so many Coolidges buried there. And, you know, uh, Calvin Coolidge's lineage and I are shared, you know, for three or four generations after that, I think. I'd have to double check. But then they split, and his family eventually made their way to, to Vermont. Uh, and, and my family uh, stayed in Watertown until my great-great-grandfather, uh, who, who you know traveled up and down the East Coast doing different jobs, but eventually settled in Galesburg, Illinois. Um, some people know Galesburg for Knox College, um, which is uh, there. And he had a farm, uh, and and then my great grandfather wanted to become a dentist, so came to the city of Chicago to to be a dentist, and he was a well known um, uh, endodontist. I think like that's the people that focus on the roots. So there's an E. David Coolidge or uh, endodontical society that I found that has like a picture and a biography of my great grandfather on their website. <laughs> um, and so then he, my father was my, uh, my grandfather and my father were born in, you know, the Chicago area. And so was I. Okay. Um, so that's the, you know, I, I think that I, I traced our lineage, you know, and I tried to figure out what you would call it. I think it was something like president Coolidge is like my second cousin four times removed or something like that. Um, yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that as well. Um, and you mentioned your sister. So is it just you and your sister in terms of siblings? I also have a, I have two older sisters. Okay. Okay. So the only boy. Yeah. Yeah. And the youngest. And the youngest. Okay. Um, so yeah, sorry. Uh, you were talking a little bit about kind of your, uh, religious upbringing and, and, and kind of having that moment, uh, that philosophical moment, as you described in the seventh grade. Um, uh, I, 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 with that, where does that journey, or where does that, where does the start of that journey begin to uncover for you, and, and where does it take you? Uh, I guess early on, in terms of uh, your own spiritual quest of trying to find meaning uh, outside, if you will, of Christianity or even within Christianity. Yeah, so I, I, I didn't say that creed. So I was never confirmed as a Christian. And then, you know, I didn't really think much of it after that. But then 
my freshman year in high school, our world history class did a field trip to a uh, Gaudiya Vaishnava temple, which is a certain uh, viewpoint within the Hindu tradition, and a Thai Buddhist temple. So then again, another strand of Buddhism. And it was a life-changing experience for me. And this was, again, uh, an aspect of Qadr for me, of divine decree, because I don't know anyone else who on that field trip, you know, their life changed. But that was that was the moment that, you know, a spark was lit in, inside me that has yet to, to be satiated. Um, and so it really was just like it came out of nowhere. Uh, and I began, uh, you know, studying religion as one of my main passions. Um, and it was both because I found religion fascinating, but also because, you know, religion is the vehicle for meaning. You know, philosophy is too, so I would study philosophy, but, you know, philosophy is just words. Religion is a whole culture, right? So you can't, you don't go to like a philosopher's, you know, temple or something where you can see how they arrange the flowers and what sort of art they put on the wall. I mean, you just read a book and then discuss it, right? It's just one aspect of human life. But religion, you know, is, you know, something that tries to paint a picture of the whole thing and then, and then bring that macrocosmic answer down to the microcosm of, for example, a temple or a mosque or, or a church, right? That, 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 that space and those things that happen inside that space are representative of the grand meaning of the universe and anything beyond it. So, so religion to me was so fascinating because of that. And I just wanted to, I, I understood that I was deeply ignorant of it because I, at this point, had no clue about Hinduism and Buddhism. I mean, this was just like, what is all of this? And so I bought a Bhagavad Gita at the Hindu temple, and I bought like an introduction to Buddhism at the Buddhist temple. Uh, and and then I, I subsequently started going back to the Hindu temple because it was relatively close to my parents uh, once I was able to drive. And... Uh, and so, you know, I became very, very interested in the Hindu tradition specifically. Uh, I eventually went to India in my spring break of my senior year. Um, and I just got to see many of the sites that I had read about and sort of see the Hindu tradition in the place where it began, even though now it's a global tradition. You know, it's so rooted in the geography and the culture of India that I, I think in that process, you know, to make a long story short, I realized on that trip that I loved Indian culture, but I had many questions about Hindu theology. Uh, and, and I had kind of just put the two together. I, I was not able to distinguish between the doctrine of reincarnation and, you know, Chana Masala, right? It was all just one amazing thing. <laughs> and so, that's you know, <laughs> that's a great analogy. I mean, it's not even an analogy, but it just uh, and, you know, know you have to just to be very very blunt. It appeals to all the senses that that comparison. Yeah, there you go. You have to understand. Like, I, I think the, the reason I frame this is where I came from is like you know I had no exposure to this. This was so I was you know the whitest of the white. I mean, I'm still very white. I remember actually after I converted to Islam, uh, and you know I've told him this story, so I'm not like. Uh, yeah, I've, I've reminded of him before. I, I, I met very soon after I converted to Islam, Rami Nashashibi, Nashashibi, Hafidahullah, may Allah preserve him and elevate him, uh, the executive director of the Inner City Muslim Action Network on the south side of Chicago. And uh, I had I met him through another white convert, but like you could say a white convert who was a lot more, I don't know, lefty, cutting edge, you know, down with, with down with the you know, the, I don't know what you, the, the phrasing is now, but like, down with the cause. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we all meet and Rami like shakes my hand, looks at me and he goes, oh, wow, you're a real white person. <laughs> 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 so, you know, so, you know, I was just trying to make sense of the world, right? And, and religion was, was, was a vehicle to making sense out of the world because religion is such a part of human history and it's such a part of the civilizations that have emerged over the last 5,000 years of recorded human history. Um, so I just del I, I really delved into all of that as much as I could. And it, you know, I sort of went to Brown University in 1997. Um, I knew I wanted to be a religious studies major. 
And so I just took the courses that were interesting and I would go, you know, visit the different religious groups or go to like, you know, Catholic mass and just sit in the back, you know, and like, just take it all in. Um, and, you know, basically to make a long story short is that I, I found great meaning and beauty and wisdom in all the world's religious traditions, but I can never submit to them. Right? I can never say, well, they know better about, you know, my life. They come from an authority higher than me as a human being, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Nietzsche has this book called Human All Too Human, right? Which is trying to bring things down to say, you know, at the end of the day, we're all just fallible human beings who are sort of stumbling in the dark. And that was where I was at, you know, I was essentially a secular humanist. Um, but I had hope that there was like a truth, but I needed to be convinced and I needed to be um, humbled. And to make a long story short, it was the Quran that did that, Not, that nothing else could do that but the Quran. Um, and I would just read this uh, translation of the Quran. It was the revised translation of Pickthall. So mm -hmm. Pickthall's old translation was like thee and thou. So this uh, uh, scholar, and I think he's in Canada, named Arafat Kail Ashi, he revised it uh, to just have more you know, simple English language. And uh, they publish it through Amana Publications. I think they still publish it. It's sort of a yellow paperback. And I would just read it all the time and just be like, I just, it's just constantly anticipating my doubts. It's constantly putting the onus back on me. It's constantly challenging me. And so I was like, well, I'll just keep reading it, yeah. you know? And uh, so I basically spent a year and a quarter reading that Quran, thinking about it. At the same time, I'm studying other traditions. Right. I'm right? still going to Catholic Mass and checking it out, still going back to my church sometimes just to reconnect with my cultural roots because Catholicism was even sort of exotic for me. Um, and, uh, and then just again, a long story short, I could turn this into a much longer story. At one night I just was like, I'm a Muslim. Like I believe, and if, if to be a Muslim is to say, I believe that there's no God, but God creator of the, you know, the universe and to say that Muhammad, this person in history is the messenger of God. And that's what I have to do to become a Muslim. Like, I, 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 even if I don't do something tomorrow to be, you know, to become a Muslim, I, 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 I believe that. What's and the role so, of the social, like, what's the social aspect of this in terms of Muslim friends or pressure from, pressure from family to conform? What's, what has that playing a factor? Um, so, at this point, my family understood that I was weird, right? That I had this, like, at the same time that I'm playing varsity basketball, at the same time that I'm, you know, trying to date different girls senior year in high school, at the same time, you know, that I'm skateboarding in the spring, at the same time that I'm, you know, studying, you know, everything I'm supposed to study and trying to get into Ivy League co college, I'm also obsessed with religion. Yeah, you're carrying on a, and, in your backpack a copy of the Bhagavad Gita or something, right? Exactly. Yeah. And there's like, you know, or I mean, I used to sit when we had vacation at, at my parents' home in Florida, you know, I would sit there and watch EWTN, Eternal Word Television Network, a sort of conservative Catholic TV station. Like, I'd get my like bowl of, you know, Lucky Charms and I'd just sit in front of the TV watching Mass or watching Mother Angelica Live or life on the rock, like all these shows by like, you know, Christian theologians or nuns. And, and they were just like, what, what are you? And then I would switch the channel to like MTV, you know, and they're just like, what? <laughs> Nobody in my family, my sister is very philosophical. So we would discuss deep questions sometimes. Um, my, I, I say I had two sisters. So the sister is closest in age to me. Um, we used to have these deep discussions sometimes, but otherwise it was just like, what? So, you know, when the summer before college, I kind of was exposed to Islam for the first time in a kind of more personal way. And I bought some books and I must have started to talk about it. Um, and my, you know, my mother in particular expressed her, her, frust her concerns. Um, and they came from a place of, you know, love and concern, but also she just didn't know much about Islam. And it was so different and foreign to her that, um, that's where her concerns came from. So 
when I told my parents the next day, when I called them on the phone the next day, I said, listen, I, I want you to know that I'm going to be, you know, I'm a Muslim and I'm going to become a Muslim. They were not unprepared, but they were still deeply concerned and upset. Um, and I would say that for the next, I mean, I, it's hard to say, but I mean, it's fine now. And we have a great relationship and we discuss things openly and, you know, they love my wife um, and they love my wife's uh, mother, Rahmatullahi Aleha, may Allah have mercy on her. Um, and so, you know, that exposure to Islam that came through my wife's family has been an incredibly positive one and has helped a great deal. Uh, but I think that, you know, before that, you know, there was a lot of bumpy, bumpy moments. Um, but I would say that in hindsight, it really just had to do with the fact that it was so foreign to them. They didn't know anybody that was Muslim. Uh, they didn't know what it meant for my choices. I mean, my dad, I think, once said to me, we just don't know if you're going to go live in Saudi Arabia for the rest of your life. You know, right. which he just, he just didn't know what to expect. Right. Um, and I don't, I, cause I was still figuring things out. I, I didn't know what to tell them, you know, to a certain extent. So like one of the formative moments was when I was a senior in, in college, um, I wanted to go to Jamia Abu Nur uh, in Syria, which is you know, now no longer, uh, I think, functioning. Um, but at the time, for those who remember in the late 90s, in the mid 90s, it was a very popular place for Americans to go to do a three year program to study, you know, kind of basic Islamic sciences from the Sunni tradition. And it was some place where Imam Waiti Muhammad's community would send people. Uh, Imam Zaid Shakir, you know, got a BA from that institution. That was his sort of main training in the Sunni tradition. And, uh, you know, so I wanted to go there after college to kind of get my really sort of solidify my understanding and practice of the faith. And, but I was trying to keep it a secret. Um, and so finally the secret kind of came out and my parents and I had a really like a lot of back and forth. I think they printed out the emails of it. And I found that like in their office once, my mom's office once. Um, and basically they were very understanding. They were just asking me questions, whatever. And then finally they, they did something which they've, never done in the rest of my adult life. They forbade me from going. Mm -hmm. And wow. they just came down. They said, you're not allowed to go. And even though I had like my own money that I could have paid to go, it was this real, you know, um, gut, gut check moment. And I basically, I, the, the conclusion I came to is this. Obeying your parents in Islam is a fard. If what they ask you to do is something that is within the limits of the Sharia, right? So if they say you have to drink this alcohol, you can disobey them. But, you know, um, in this case, this, they weren't for, for making me do something haram. And then studying the religion in this way is something that is mustahab, right? It's, it's recommended, but it's not required. Right. And so they were perfectly within their rights to do so. And, uh, and I... I just said, you know, if I'm really, if I actually believe this tradition and it's not just some sort of like, I'm going to go gallivanting around the Middle East, uh, you know, put on my kafiya and like, be like, hey, everybody, like I'm doing the Muslim thing, you know, like, but I actually believe this is from God right. and that there's rules that God has established for me to have clarity in how I live my life. I have to obey them, even though they're not Muslim. And, and that, I, you know, until I got to visit Damascus in the summer of 2008, you know, this was uh, 2001 when I was graduating. So from 2001 to 2008, I, that decision defined my life in so many ways. Um, and uh, but I don't regret it. I don't regret it at all. It was so hard, and it just it was so hard. But I I don't regret it at all. And and subsequently, many years later, I actually found in a book a ruling. It said exactly that, that your non-Muslim parents can forbid you from doing something mustahab, and that's perfectly within their rights. And you so, would have been stuck, you, you would have been stuck, I guess, I don't, I don't want to use the word stuck in a negative concept, but it, the timing is really interesting if you're telling me summer of 01, right? Because you would have been starting your overseas education in the fall of 2001, right around 9-11. So the timing, you're like, that's kind of a very different path if you had gone, maybe, you know, right? Yeah, I mean, who knows what would have happened. Um, yeah. 
Now, I, that's right. That's right. Um, and so then, uh, just in terms of timeline now, um, when you and I met in 2002, this summer, um, you hadn't spent any time overseas studying Arabic. You had only done sort of the, uh, whatever study of Arabic, either locally or through the, like in academia. Yeah. The only time I had been to a Muslim majority country from between 1998, when I took my Shahada to 2002, which was when I was doing that El Lisan Arabic program, uh, uh in uh, uh, the album program. Yeah. Um, uh, the only Muslim majority country I had been to was Kuwait, which I had visited at the invitation of my former roommate at Brown, who had grown up in Kuwait. Mm. And he said, come you know, visit us and spend you know, your, your um, spring break of your senior year uh, with us. And it was a wonderful visit. And, and I'm still friends with him. Uh, he actually lives in Sunnyvale, um, crazy enough. And uh, so we see each other regularly, alhamdulillah. Um, and, but I had studied at University of Chicago for their summer program. Um, Professor Scott Lucas had been my, uh, sort of he was overseeing the program and he's someone who had a big impact on my life. Uh, I, th- I, did and- that, I did that same summer program, yeah. Um, uh, Omar, what year did uh, your sister get married? Your younger, your younger sister? Summer two thousand three. That's right. So it was the summer of two thousand three. I did the uh, I did the uh, language intensive program at University of Chicago. Uh, and I was living with my brother, who you know, Masroor, of course. Um, he had an apartment off of like State and Division or something like that. This is before he he got married. Uh, so we were both kind of. I was even though I was married, had a child, but my family was visiting their family in Houston, and I spent that whole summer in Chicago. Um, it was a hot summer. It was a summer of the uh, big blackout that happened um, that affected like a lot of the Midwest and most of the Eastern seaboard. Um, and then it was also uh, because of that program and the number of absences I could have without like basically flunking out and getting no credit. I couldn't attend Omar's sister's wedding here in California. <laughs> anyway, no. I'll be short. Um, so, so uh, I guess, yeah, you know, now, um, I, I guess to Omar's question then about the, the communal kind of like, was there any community that you tapped into early on in terms of either, either, either at Brown or, or elsewhere, Chicago, uh, that connected you to the community or the communal aspect of, 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 of Islam. And I guess because we're going to get there eventually anyway, um, I guess maybe talk to us about how you're processing even Muslim tradition vis-a-vis Sunniism and Shiism, like, is that something that you're even, you know, sort of acknowledging and, and, and not struggling with, but, but sort of, you know, in terms of really assessing, or is it just, okay, I was introduced to the Sunni tradition and hence this is what I'm going with. I mean, I know maybe some of this is yeah. going to be hindsight, like you're looking back at it, but if you could maybe kind of go back into the moment and, and just kind of look at things, you know, moving forward as it were. Yeah, to keep it succinct, um, I brought with me into the tradition my desire to do due diligence that I had done for religion in general. So just as I had discovered, you know, hundreds of different ways of looking at religion prior to accepting Islamic tradition as a sort of paradigm that I believed in, I knew that there was many, many different ways of looking at Islam. So I wanted to continuously, you know, study the tradition and understand all of its complexities and nuances and details and so on and so forth. But also, you know, I was wanting to practice, you know. And so, you know, if you're a white convert, you know, you you can only practice what is available to you geographically speaking. So... I was defined by, for example, the Brown Muslim Students Association, which was, you know, I was a student at that time, and it was a very diverse group of people uh, with a lot of different perspectives on things, and it was about creating a community out of that diversity and and acknowledging that. I was part of the uh, Islamic Center of Rhode Island, Masjid al Karim, and my first kind of imam, who was my teacher, Imam Abdul Hamid, rahmatullahi alayhi, may Allah have mercy on him. Uh, who taught me, you know, basic beginnings of Arabic 
uh, how to you know fiqh of prayer and tahara, uh, how to read the from the mushaf using using uh, Durrani qaida that you know little text and that people use in South Asia it has all the Urdu on the side, <laughs> which I didn't never understood what it was saying, but it, I could read the letters. Yeah. Um, but that masjid is, you know, led by an African American imam who had studied in Pakistan, was married to a Pakistani wife, included a lot of Afghan refugees, a lot of African Americans, white converts. Wow. I made a friend there, uh, you know, that's still my friend, Najmuddin, who was a white convert from Camden, New Jersey. Uh, you know, so it was, you know, it was more conservative than the Brown Muslim Students Association, but still exemplifying that unity and community, um, that accept that acceptance of diversity. Uh, and, uh, it wasn't until I went back to Chicago that I was exposed to like the much more narrow masjid culture. Like the, here is our predominantly Hyderabadi Sunni masjid. Here is our predominantly Palestinian Sunni masjid. You know, you know, you know like it, it, it's not only, it's not like Arab or South Asian. Yeah. It's like, much it's like, parochial. you know, it's, it's sectarian you know, on some level, and it's also, you know, very defined you know, eth ethnically on another level. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I found a Bosnian masjid where I used to sometimes go for Jumma, and I just, I would pretend <laughs> that I was Bosnian. I wouldn't actually do anything, but in my mind, I'd be like, oh, what if I were Bosnian? I look around, all these people look like me, you know, but then, you know, after the, the Salah and we'd talk, right, it was very clear that, you know, even though we looked similar, we had totally different cultural, you know, background. Um, but it was at least comforting on that level. <laughs> True Caucasian, um, yeah, yeah. What? True Caucasian, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, encounter um, Caucasians, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I mean, it was, it was something where, and I was just, you know, continuously learning. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so the Alam program, I'll say, you know, was something that was very beneficial for me because it, it really tried to deal with this diversity. But what I will say is that, you know, in all of these spaces, uh, you know, there was a, it was a sort of Sunni Sunnism that was there as the universal, even though it was it was not explicitly stated, yeah. right? So there's this wonderful article that I think many in our community should read called "Understanding Structural Anti Shiism in Sunni Diaspora Spaces" by Huda Katsabi, and I think she explains this very very well. That you know, there's a Shi erasure. That happens even in these spaces where there's a lot of you know diversity and a lot of respect for Muslim unity because Shiism is many respects that which Sunnism defines itself against. Historically speaking, Shiism really began first, and Sunnism developed historically as a response to that Shi identity and the way it was manifested, you know, historically. So the concept of Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah emerges, you know, as like a well, what are we? Well, we're this. And, you know, there's many different strands and flavors of Ahmad Sunnah wal Jama'ah, right? So it's not even one thing, but it becomes that kind of overall term for that which is not Shiism. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, even though, for example, in the Alam program, they discussed, you know, some of the early, you know, caliphal history. I mean, it was not, there's not Shi, any Shi scholars. Yeah. You don't get to understand Shi theology, Shi fiqh. You don't get to understand the Shi understanding of those early history. That's right. Right. And so, but I, I, did, I didn't know that at the time. Right. I was just like, wow, this is, this is really much more intellectually satisfying than what I have learned previously. And so I attached myself, for example, to people like Munir Fareed as like someone who could give me insights into what it meant to be a Muslim, be critical, be intellectual, but also be faithful. Um, and, and I think that that became, you know, my paradigm when I went into graduate school. I was at first in a graduate program at Princeton. That's a whole other story. Um, and then I carried that into my engagement with the community when I became a chaplain. Uh, and so when I became a chaplain, I, I, I wanted to be open to the Shi community because I had read enough at this point to understand that there was this rich tradition that I wasn't, you know, part of. Uh, but they were my Muslim brothers, and I wanted to. Um, you know, make space for them as the leaders of these communities, these campus communities. Uh, and all of the people that were she that were, you know, part of that experience were incredibly positive about that. They were incredibly thankful about that. Um, but there just weren't that many, right? And, 
And so it really wasn't until after I stopped being a chaplain, I was teaching at NYU and I was giving the chutbah at NYU. I was basically a volunteer chaplain um, helping Imam Khalid Latif, who's my friend and a wonderful person, a lot, increase him, elevate his rank. Um, that I was really exposed to the Shi tradition in a more direct way. And that was through the majalis, the, the gatherings that happened in the first you know, nine nights of, of the month of Muharram, leading up to the day of Ashura, the 10th of Muharram, when Imam Hussein was killed, alayhi salam, may peace be upon him. And I went to the first majlis. It was the first time I really had an opportunity. I mean, I had been in a Shi masjid, for example, like the Islamic Center of America in Dearborn, yeah. to see Imam Zaid Shakir speak. <laughs> I had been, you know, uh, you know, I had, when I first got to Princeton and I met Najm Haider, um, who is a professor at Barnard now, I said to him, you know, can you give me some books on Shiism? I don't know that much. Um, and, you know, so I was, I was trying, but it wasn't until this moment that I was really exposed to Shiism as like a living tradition, as a living force. The same way you might think that people feel about when they first, you know, go to Medina and pray in the masjid. Like, I, you know, I was, I was, I was a convert. And, you know, I, I, I believed in Islam and I prayed, but it wasn't until I was in Medina with, you know, 10,000 other Muslims praying Salat al-Fajr that I was like, oh, this is Islam, you know, or like, this is, this is where it's really at. Or the way that Sufis talk about, you know, you, I wasn't really in love with the Prophet or Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, your peace and blessings be upon him and his family. I wasn't really desiring of God or thinking about God in a deeper way until I was, I, I went to that gathering with my sheikh. And he, you know, we did the Latifiyya or, you know, it was a Hadra or he gave this talk that entered into my heart, right? That's how it was for me when I first went to this majlis that had been put together by a group called Muharram in Manhattan. And this majlis was led by uh, Sheikh Fayaz Jafar, who is now the Shi chaplain at, at NYU. But at this point was just a sort of independent scholar who had been brought in to lead the majlis that... I went there because I was like trying to show ecumenical solidarity with my Shi brothers and sisters. Like I'm a leader in this community. I do a weekly halakha. Right. I give the Friday khutbah. I work with Khalid. Let me embrace this part of our community. And I went home that night just totally confused. And I wrote this poem to Imam Hussein about it um, that because I, I didn't know what else to do. And then I think I, I said, you know, I, I thought I was going to go that one night. And I went back for every single night and, you know, by Ashura, I was on a, on a path that I am, I'm still on to this day. Mm. Um, but I would say this is that I wrote a post on Facebook, um, you know, at that point about Sheikh Faiz Jafar. Yeah. Um, and some Sunni ulama, some like senior Sunni ulama, like told me to like basically take it down, told me it, you know, to that there was a problem with that, and and uh, and these are people that generally are seen as like more welcoming, open Sunni Sulema. I was basically saying this man has taught me something I never heard before. And yeah. He is like, you know, in la ta'alamun. Ask the people of remembrance if you don't know. I was like, this is I've experienced this in the presence of the scholar. Right. And they like on the you know in private were like, you know, what's going on? And you yeah. know, I so. You know, immediately when I, I expressed that, you know, the whole issue came up. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, there's, there's a story there, but I, I think I think I'll resist uh, in terms of just yeah, me me kind of encountering like, oh, is, is David kind of experimenting with Shiism or whatever? But a, a, a quick question for you is, um, you, you did your MA at at, at Princeton. Um, do you meet any, like, I, I know there's Dr. Hussein Mudarusi is there, who's a, a leading sort of she legal scholar, but do you meet any other, like, yeah, I'm just curious about your encounters with him or anybody else along that journey prior to your experiences at the Majalis in Manhattan? Yeah, so my studies at Princeton um, were one that, Made, made me delve into this question from an intellectual standpoint. Mm. Um, so my classes, I would say particularly with Michael Cook and Hussein Badarasi, which were, I took two seminars with each, and they were very, very formative into how I navigated the textual history of our, our community. 
you know, because the way that they would teach is all in Arabic text. And they would just give you, you know, something, you, there'd be a theme, for example. So like the theme might be rebellion. And so Michael Cook would give you like a passage from Tabari's text. And then some later, you know, manuscript, a couple of pages from a manuscript that didn't tell you what it was. And you had to figure out what it was. And it would end up being some, you know, medieval Zaidi treatise on political authority. And you would, you know, go through all this and you, you would, and the process realize the diversity of our tradition, but I think also really realize the contentiousness with which things always existed. Mm. Uh, that this fabrication that like somehow we were all, everything was all good until, you know, maybe sometime in the middle of the Umayyad Caliphate. Right. Right. No, it was there from day one. Correct. Right. When you read the accounts of Saqifa, right, in these early texts, you know that it was there from day one. It was contained um, within the community. And, yeah, the, yeah. And, and, and you read the historical accounts of how Imam Ali, alayhi salam, peace be upon him, was dealing with what was happening. Just so, like, for, for example, the person who was the greatest warrior under the leadership of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who fought in so many battles and had so many heroic feats, refuses to fight under the first three caliphates and stays in his home and teaches privately. I mean, that tells you something, right? You can't wipe that away from history. You can bring some narration and say, oh, look, Omar asked Ali to like advise him you know, on this issue. That's great. We don't deny that, mm-hmm. right? But like, tell me why he refused to serve in the military under the three successors to the person that he w- was willing to give his life for. Right. So, and that's just something that I never, ever, ever heard in the context of a Sunni space. Right. It wasn't until I was at Princeton and I was studying these texts for myself that I started to ask these questions. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, yes, Professor Madaris, he was a, was a um, influence on me, but he was very, very um, reticent about being a spiritual guide for the students. Yeah. He actually, mashallah, when he realized that I was going through something, he took me aside and, and we had a sort of private session totally on his initiative. And I am eternally grateful for him for that. Um, and other things that I won't mention, but you know, he, that was not his, what he wanted to do. Right. He, he had his scholarly interests and he wanted to write his articles and his books and they're very, very beneficial. Um, but uh, you know, it was just a different, he had a different way of doing things. Um, and and I needed I needed something more, so it wasn't like I could I could um, I don't you know sort of hang my hat on him as my you know yeah. marja or my. No, I, I appreciate you saying yeah. that, and I've always been curious about that, uh, just in terms of him. But I am equally curious. And this is just me kind of geeking out for a moment, so I, I I almost want to apologize to our listeners and and Omar if you allow me this little bit of geek moment because I don't know when else I might have this opportunity to ask someone who studied at Princeton. Uh, but, but from someone who, you know, at least in, in a previous life, so to speak, um, you know, delved into Muslim uh, academia or, or the academy and, and Islamic studies from an academic perspective, Michael Cook is, is a name you hear a lot. So I'm just, like I said, from a completely aside, I know it's not even related to what we're talking about other than the fact that you mentioned his name and I don't know when I'll, I'll get to ask especially someone who I consider, um, you know, uh, you know, a friend and, and, and a colleague, as it were. Um, your thoughts on Michael Cook? I mean, I know because I know that he often gets lumped up, like lumped in with this sort of the whole agorism school and so on. And without getting into too much of the weeds, just your reaction to kind of how you see him as a scholar, um, if you don't mind. If you if you want to go, if yeah, you want to say yeah, no, I'm happy to go there, but I need to preface it with a larger statement, please. Um, as I, as I mentioned, I'm going to be teaching at Bayan Islamic Graduate School this fall, and my course is about trying to understand the the wide swath of human history from an Islamic theological perspective. Right? How do we the rise of the human species, the rise of civilization, the rise of agriculture? You know, all these big questions, the rise of religion. Um, 
And the reason I'm doing that is because at Princeton, I was exposed to the secular meta narrative of human history. It was the thing that was always there, whether you're in the religion department, Near Eastern studies, history, which are the three main departments that I worked in, that is the paradigm that defines it. So if you don't understand what that means, you can read the book Sapiens, which has you know, sold 10 million copies, and it will give you that understanding. Um, Sec- uh, that is secular humanism? Like yeah, a, sort of the secular humanist faith. Yeah, that's right. You know, or you could say the sort of scientific view of history. Thank you. Um, and so Michael Cook had, has also written a book like that called A Brief History of the Human Race. And he gives his take on what it, you know human history is all about. So you have to understand about Michael Cook is that you know he is, he's a historian that's working within that meta framework. And he, he doesn't you know dislike religion per se. He just doesn't believe in it at all. <laughs> right? He doesn't believe in Christianity. He doesn't believe in Judaism. He doesn't believe in Islam, right? And it's very clear in his book. And then he and he believes that it should be religion should be understood as this kind of myth that still you know pervades human history, but is part of human history. So when he approaches his Islam, the, the you know the focus of his scholarship is that the a primary assumption is it's completely not true, right? Right. It's just whatever is true about it is just human all too human to give that Nietzschean phrase, right? And so let's just look at the texts that these people produced in history, whether that's the Quran or the Sirah of the Prophet or later fifth works or whatever. So, for example, his book Commanding Right and Forbidding Wrong in Islamic Thought is like a magisterial study of all that Muslims have written about Amr bin Maruf wa Nahyan al Munkar. I mean, it is a brilliant work of scholarship. Um, because he just goes back and he just tells you what was going on with the Zaydis, what was going on with the Malikis, what was going on with the Imami Shis in the past and in the present. And he goes to an enormous array of sources. But if you read that book in the beginning, in the, in the introduction and in the conclusion, he talks a little bit about why. Mm-hmm. And he basically is because in his world, secular politics should rule. And Amr bel Maruf and Nahyan al Munkar is a, a way in which religion is infused with the idea of the commanding power of the state and the forbidding power of the state, and he's concerned that that you know c- could be a problem. Of course, right, and that's where you see a little bit of his own beliefs, you know, in his work. But in the previous section, he's just you know going through all this stuff. Now he can sometimes be a little bit irreverent in his writing, but I will tell you, in his two seminars with him. I never heard a word from him of disrespect to the Islamic tradition. And he very, very, very rarely ever said what he, what he thought. And usually, actually, the only times I can think when he said what he thought was when he was pressed by the students in the class, usually non-Muslims, to give his take. And so I studied, we, I was in class with Najim Haider, who teaches at um, Barnard. I was in class with Nancy Khalid, who teaches at... Um, uh, uh, Brown University now, um, was, and was he was a, one of the greatest professors I've ever had. Sorry, because he would. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to ask you if Maraj was a classmate of yours. I don't. We never took. He came a little bit later, so he never took the seminar with me. Okay. Um, Sorry. Go ahead. But so he was one of the greatest professors I ever had, and he taught me so much about how to navigate these, you know, sources. I mean, it was it was so interesting and fun and deep. And wide ranging, um, the courses that he he taught me, uh, and so his his pedagogy in the classroom is radically different than his scholarship. Um, but the link between the two is just that you have to have a a command of the of the the early sources, right? You have to be able to find your way through them. So when you're reading Tabari, who are these people that they're talking about, and then who are the people in the Isnads, and why does it matter? Um, and so. You know, that, that was my experience of studying with him, and, and it definitely had a profound impact on me because at the end of the day, yes, these things are just texts. They're just words written on a page. Even the Quran, they're just words written on a page. People can go to Barnes & Noble, pick it up, buy it, and decide for themselves. So they think it's, you know, Kalam Allah, the speech of the divine, or it's just the words of Muhammad, or something in between, or whatever. Right? Like, you know, they're... they're the textual tradition of our, our community is one that only get, is given life and meaning when people who embody those texts live it out in the world, right? Otherwise, they're just books on a shelf. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, we may have ontological 
beliefs about them, such that the Quran, for example, is kalamullah, right? But that, even from that secular perspective, is just what I'm saying as a, as a fallible human being. Or that's just what Al-Ghazali or Alam al-Hindi was writing about in their theological texts, which any non-Muslim atheist can pick up and learn Arabic and read for themselves and say, okay, well, this is what they said. Mm-hmm. You know, so what you learn in that process is that your faith comes from somewhere else. It does not come from erudition in the Islamic tradition. So, yeah, you're talking a lot of, about a, really, a lot of really interesting ideas, and I'm, I'm still thinking about those 10 days you described and the experience you had and what came out. And, you, you need, and I'd love to hear kind of the, the out- aftermath of that. Uh, I don't know if Barbiz, if you had any, any other things you wanted to touch on, but that's, well, that's what no, I, think I think you're about. I think that's great. Uh, I, I think it's exactly where I wanted to go, um, although I guess I was going to frame it just slightly a little different, uh, which is, I mean, and, and it go, you know, certainly take you back to those 10 days, but perhaps through the bridge of what you were just talking about, which is this idea that, what is pervasive in the academy uh, in terms of the context within which religion is studied is uh, the sort of secular humanist perspective. And, and, I, and for me, that's almost analogous to how conversations around Sin- Sunnism and Shiism, whether it's history, theology, tradition as a whole, are also, in terms of the mainstream Muslim community, also framed within the hegemony or supremacy of Sunniism, in this case, as opposed to secular humanism in the academy. You know, would you make that kind of an analogy? And if so, or if you agree with that frame, then I guess, then what what is left for the believer to do, or the, or the inquisitor to do, or the person who's searching to do, the, and we're all on this, we're all sadics, right? We're all on this journey. We're all on the journey here. And so we're all seeking, um, is to consciously try to decouple when them, you know, themselves from that hegemonic or hegemonic, if you will, or supremacy kind of that's imposed, whether it's secular humanity, humanism, you know, or it's uh, Sunnism, uh, within the Muslim community. Sorry, that's a mouthful. Uh, it's a very deep question. Um, I think that you know the beginning is is being self aware, right? Is being aware of the way that you're situated in the political economy of the world and of human history in general, right? So, you know, there's certain facts that we can kind of hang our head on. Right? We can hang our head on, you know, for example, the fact that we live in a world of nation states you know, that sort of has its origins in the Treaty of Westphalia and the attempt to, you know, create secure borders that then, you know, change the world from a state of constant war to a state of sort of peace as the default um, that then, you know, war is sort of the exception to, right? And if you don't understand that part of human history, which is, you know, pretty well accepted, right, you're not going to understand a little bit about where we are situated in time and space and why, for example, each nation state tries to craft its own dominant narrative, right? And how, for example, in America, the struggle between the secular humanist worldview and the Christian worldview is really, you know, probably the, the, the driving factor of American political history when it, when it comes to matters of policy, when it comes to matters of worldview, when it comes to matters of education. Um, in a way that, as you know, many people understand that the, you know, the arise of the Safavid Empire and the Ottoman Empire, you know, in you know the 1500s, 1600s, uh, you know, is central to how we have the Middle East that we have today now, where you have, for example, Turkey acting as a sort of beacon of hope for many Sunnis, Iran acting as a beacon of hope for many. You know, uh, Shi'is, um, and then and then you know the Wahhabi, you know, rebellion against the Ottoman Empire, creating the what is now the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, you know, acting as you know a, a, a different socio political entity that emerges out of you know primarily out of World War One yeah. and its aftermath, um, and so you know you have to be aware to deal with those types of deep questions you were just asking, Parvez. You can't, 
you can't just reason it out from your own personal feelings and your own personal experience. You have to understand, like we live on a, a, a one planet that has a fixed geography and has 5,000 years of recorded human history and everything before that, we have to use inference, like look at genetic data, look at archeological evidence, right? We believe in a prophet called Noah, peace be upon him, and Jews and Christians do as well, but there's no archaeological evidence that is you know, going to go out and convince the secular historian that Noah existed. That's right. Right? He exists in Hebrew texts. He exists in Aramaic and you know, Greek texts, and he exists in Arabic texts. And we have faith that he, he existed and that his, his, his dawah, his calling people to Islam, was a central moment in human history. Right? But we have to be able to explain that to people that don't believe in that, right? Because it's not part of the grand narrative of the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they don't talk about Noah at the United Nations and say, well, remember when Noah and the flood happened, you know, right? But they'll talk about the Roman Empire because, you know, there's yeah. eight gazillion sources of information about the Roman Empire. You just travel to France and see a massive Roman aqueduct that was, was 2,000 years old, and you'll be like, wow. Yeah. That's 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 amazing. No, it's and the Quran tells that. us to do this. Yeah. You know, right. fil -arb. Go travel in the land and see what happened to the people that came before you. You have to think about it, right? For us, like the Christian conquest of the Roman Empire is a Quranic, you know, prophesied and uh, hoped for historical phenomenon no muslim will talk about that they might talk about sort of room into this like one little historical incident you take you take the biggest empire in human history at that time is then completely changed over the course of 800 years from the birth of jesus alayhi salam peace be upon him until you know the sort of establishment of christendom as the sort of dominant narrative of the mediterranean correct uh because even at this point the Christians were in the majority in North Africa that was ruled by Muslims, right? And the Quran says that the Christians are the closest to the believers, right? And the Quran, you know, talks about the, the, the victory of Rome, right? And, you know, but in this context, it's the, the, the Byzantines, the Christians. And, 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 yet, and yet people don't connect those dots and say, well, a Muslim view of history is one where you see these Christian victories as part of our history, Right? It's part of the journey of, you know, the, the, the truth of God throughout human history. Instead, they just want to say, we're Muslims, they're Christians, we're right, they're wrong. They have Europe, we have the Middle East. And it's like, that, that, is, that is not satisfying to the intellect or to the human soul. It may be satisfying to people that have a smaller vision, right? And they just want to carve out their little piece of the pie. But if you really believe Islam is for all human beings, that these people like Noah and Jesus and Muhammad were sent to all human beings, you have to be able to explain how human history is part of that that journey, you know, of, of faith, of the, this great struggle between Iman and Kufr, between true faith and, and turning away from God. And, and and so, you know, we have a lot of work to do to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, we can't be uh, afraid of uh, those that complexity and those details. And we also have to be able to listen to our intellects and listen to our hearts as we take in all of this data to try and find ways to make it coherent. Because this is the great question, is that how do you make it coherent for you, mm -hmm. right? So, so, you know, if you, are, if you are someone who is living in under a secular system, right, you have that in you, right? You cannot deny that. It's already been ingrained in you in, in powerful ways, right? So you have to... You have to go, sort of engage in an act of the liberation of the mind first and foremost. And this is Dr. Hatzenbazian's idea in his book, Palestine into something colonial that I'm drawing on. Right? You have to engage in an act of the liberation of the mind, right? To, to understand where you are and how you've been formed by this history and how you're, you're going to become a free person who is able to say, you know, I understand why people look at history this way or look at, you know, the meanings of these things this way. But I don't buy it. Right? I, I, I buy a different story. And maybe I don't know all the answers, but I don't know, have to know all the answers because I'm fallible. And I'm just simply trying to tell the story in the most coherent way that I know how. So I hope that, that, I hope that, that answers your question. No, no, I, I love that question. But. 
Well, thank you for just really taking on, you know, addressing it and answering it the way you did, because I think in many ways, not only does it address the question, at, you know, that I asked, and I appreciate you engaging it that way, but also it, it, in, in a lot of what you were saying, I couldn't help but, again, just thinking of where I want to take the conversation and where I know the story goes, which is like you in those 10 days. I mean, a lot of what you just talked about, which is, you know, sort of how to how, how you make sense of history and tradition and how it relates to you as an individual, you know, brings us to David Coolidge in those you know, first nine nights or 10 days of Muharram um, that many years ago. And here we are, you know, that many years later. So I guess in the brief time that we have, and I know I want to be mindful of your time more than uh, me and Omar, I think we're good, but you let us know in terms of, uh, you know, when you need to, when you need to drop off and we'll continue this conversation, uh, you know, when we have you back, inshallah, God willing. But uh, yeah, so maybe kind of take us to David Coolidge sitting there and, and how you're then processing all of this. Um, and then, you know, we really, I think it, you know, like I said, I know we teased it or mentioned it at the beginning, but I do want to talk about, you know, why that's relevant now in the first 10 days of Ramadan or, or I'm sorry, excuse me, Muharram and the month of Muharram were beyond the first 10 days. Um, and maybe kind of a wrap it up with a conversation around, you know, Shiism and Sunnism in a very meta or, ap, you know, a general level. So, yeah, so. Just to be very clear, I, I'm telling my story, right? And it's very different from many other people's story. I, yeah. Um, you know, my story is one of just constant searching uh, and willingness to change. And this this is part of my personality before um, I was, you know, even Muslim. Um, and And that willingness to sort of say, you know, I have to keep learning. I can't. I know there's so many things I don't understand. I don't understand hardly anything of Chinese history. I don't know the Chinese language. I don't know the history of the Communist Party. I don't, I've read a book about Mao Zedong and it was really interesting. You know, <laughs> you know, I, I read Factory Girls about, you know, women who work in the factories in Southern China. You know, I don't know that much. I try, you know, to know more. And I, if I had another life to live, I would love to, you know, be a scholar of Chinese history, you know, but, I, you know, there's a sort of a, a, a narrow time frame in which I'm trying to figure these things out. And I'll make it easy. I mean, and, and so I, I, I d dove into the questions of the Sunishi thing because, you know, when I left Brown, I thought that my, I was going to have some space in my life to grow spiritually now that I'm not in a leadership role direct, directly, like Khaled was going to be the leader of NYU and I was just going to help him when he wanted me to. Um, so that sort of the burden was off my shoulders. Because um, I was also very involved in the Rhode Island Muslim community. So I was, you know, it wasn't just Brown. It was like the whole state I was involved in and all the, all the imams and everything. So, um, you know, I thought I had this time to grow. And I thought it would be, I would like deepen my understanding of Maliki fiqh. I would like, you know, understand the Shadali you know, tradition of Tasawwuf better and I would grow. And this moment I realized, no, there's deeper questions that I have. Like it's not... I'm not going to be satisfied by that approach. So I need to go back and I need to, I need to tease out the foundations of, of my faith and then see where the fault lines are. And at one point I remember I was so weighty on my heart and my shoulders. I just like, well, what is the core principle that I, that I trust in? And I was like thinking and I was writing and I ended up writing out on a piece of paper. I wrote, God is fair and he understands that I'm trying. Sorry. And I'll tell you, I prayed so much that the Prophet ﷺ would come to me in a dream and just tell me what to do. All I, you know, I, and I had a point where I was just like, God, I don't care what it is. Just tell me how to be someone who is doing um, in my short life what you want me to do. And his representing you as the source of all knowledge you know, in my small human life. You know, and it was so painful that I was not given some sort of like mystical vision. Yeah. And then I could just put my subjectivity aside and say, God intervened in my life in this way that, you know, would just, you know, trump everything else. And so I just kept trying. 
So I, I was taking care of my son at the time a lot because my wife was working. So I'd play with him during the day and when he'd take a nap, I'd read. And then I'd play with him in the afternoon when my son, wife came home from work, you know, I'd, I'd read. And alhamdulillah, like in the process, I was able to go on Ziyara with Sheikh Fayaz Jafar to um, Najaf and Karbala and Baghdad and Samara. And, uh, you know, it was one where I felt that I had to go. Right? I was like, well, I, you know, I'm not getting this mysti mystical vision, um, but I still have things that Allah is facilitating for me. Right? He's giving me the time to, to read. He's giving me the time to learn from different people and travel, you know, on the weekends, go to different masjids and visit people and ask just questions and so on and so forth. And now, alhamdulillah, we have this full-time babysitter and I'm able to, you know, leave for nine days or whatever it was. And, you know, my son will be fine and my wife will be fine. So, bismillah. Yeah, you know, I, I couldn't help but reflect on what you were saying just earlier about, like, as human beings, we look for that divine intervention or sign or God to, like, almost literally speak to us directly. But I think, you know, if I could just as an observer and take this for what it's worth, but, you know, just, just you know, where God may not do that, he certainly opens doors or avenues or means. And so for me, just hearing you talk about how, you know, being afforded the time uh, because, you know, you were, you, you know, you had a full-time babysitter, et cetera, where you could explore, you know, these questions that you were wrestling with, you know, that's the divine, right? That's the divine kind of coming in and intervening in your own life. And um, if not speaking to you, you know, directly or literally, I should say, is intervening, certainly. Yeah, so, you know, I would say that when I went on Ziara to Iraq, Right, it felt like that. Like there were so many instances where it was like, it's like I wrote about this. Like I wrote, for example, a letter to Muslim Ibn Aqil, uh, the messenger and representative of Imam Hussein who was sent to the city of Kufa, sort of expressing my condolences, you know, about his martyrdom, but also asking sort of for his forgiveness and, and, and my shock that I just didn't know his story up until that point in my life. Um, and it's such a powerful story. Um, and so then when I'm at the grave of Muslim Ibn Aqil in Kufa, I'm just like, I can't believe I, I'm here. I, I wrote a letter to you on the other side of the world, and now I'm here. And, you know, assalamu alaikum, you know, ya Muslim Ibn Aqil. And so, you know, that ziyara really felt that way. And I, I, there was a central moment, which was when you go to Baghdad for ziyara, right? At the time, it was still a little unsafe because ISIS was you know, still in the north, um, they basically said, you have to come, do your ziyarah, and then leave. So we came, went to the masjid, uh, Al-Qadimain in Baghdad, big, amazing, beautiful masjid where the seventh and the ninth imams are buried, uh, and also many great scholars, many great ulama. Um, and, and then we went back to our hotel. We slept a little bit, woke up, had a little breakfast. I'm uh, sorry, we then went back for Fajr. And... Uh, when we were praying in Salat al-Fajr, we were praying outside in Qadimain. And there were probably a thousand people there. You know, it wasn't a special time. It wasn't, you know, Ashura. It wasn't in Shah Ramadan. It was just any old day. And there were a thousand people there. And the sheikh was leading the prayer. It was an old sheikh with a turban and a big beard and a beautiful recitation. And a big, beautiful masjid. You know, the lights coming up in the sky. And I had this, this moment, this aha moment. I said to myself, if I had converted at this moment, this would just be Islam for me. This wouldn't be Shiism. This would just be Islam. And I think that was the turning point, you know, in many respects, where I was able to finally see, you know, that the Islam that we're looking for is, you know, something that is, for example, for many Sunnis, they see it in Sunnism, but they've never seen it in Shiism. Shiism is always something different, something other. And I think that that's essentially where I was up until that point. But now I could at least see Shiism as just Islam and Sunnism as Sunnism, you know, because from the Shi tradition, Sunnism is, you know, the, the sort of incomplete, you know, tradition or the, the different tradition that, you know, has a lot that's right about it 
you know, but it's, has some it has some issues. <laughs> um, and so once I was able to cross that line and, and, and begin to sort of see the Shi'i tradition as just Islam that is taught by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam and Imam Ali and Sayyidah Fatima and Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein and so on and so forth, then I felt I was able to more fairly, you know, sort of arbitrate or evaluate the two. You know, but, and I'll just say this, that to your point, Parvez, about, you know, the sort of presence of God, it's not just like about intellectual argumentation or this proof and that proof or whatever. There's also, we live these things as we're studying them. That's the difference between studying something that you don't believe, like the way that Michael Cook studies the Islamic tradition, versus being a Muslim who's on a journey to deepen their commitment to Islam, right? You can't, you have to do both simultaneously. You have to be connected to God and connected to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the same time that you're being critical and you're asking questions and you're reading and you're traveling and you're exploring. And I just kept praying for guidance. And, you know, in so many instances, that guidance came through the Shi tradition in a way that in the past comes through the Sunni tradition and through came through Shi ulama as opposed to Sunni ulama. I came through Shi books as opposed to Sunni books. Um, and so it just became, to make a long story short, it became a gradual transition where even though I was part of both communities now, and I really was living in, in between these communities, my private Islam, the Islam that started to make sense to me, the Islam of you know your, 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 your beliefs and your practices in private really became more the Shi tradition. And then it was just, once that happened, it was just sort of, well, how do I reemerge into the world now as just someone who still, you know, loves Khalid Latif and loves Rami Nashashibi and loves Munir Farid and respects the work that they've done, you know, but understands that I have a different take on things now. Um, uh, but then I'll say, to, to finalize that, that, you know, I'm still learning, right? I'm still on that journey. And if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam appears to me in a dream and he says, you know, you got to do this or you got to do that. I mean, how, how, can you how can you refuse the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Because isn't that what we're trying to get back to? Mm -hmm. and we're trying to get back to Medina. We're trying to get back to Badr. You know, we're trying to get back to Uhud. Right? We're trying to be those people that would have, would have stood in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam you know, to defend him with our lives because he was the one who came from God to teach us how to be the best human beings we can be. And I would just say that for me, once I started to understand the stance of Imam Hussein on Ashura, it was, it's, it's, I, there's no way I can conceptualize being loyal to the Prophet without conceptualizing my, my willingness to die to, in defense of Imam Hussein. And, and, it's just, it's just impossible. I can't, I can't imagine how it could be otherwise. But I would say up until the, the process that began with going to this majlis, I, I did not understand that whatsoever. Even though I said, oh, I love my Shi brothers and sisters. I love the family of the prophet. I didn't, mm -hmm. I was just saying things. A whole new world opened up to me that I just never knew for 15 years of being Muslim. Wow, David. Well, thanks really for sharing that really personal uh, experience. I really appreciate it. You know, I, I grew up in a, in a place where it was small town, one masjid, very diverse, but very um, Sunni. In fact, um, very Khaliji, if you could say a lot of, a lot of students from, from the Middle East. So I really knew nothing about the Shia tradition. And I, would, I, was, I was hoping uh, if you could tell us a little more for those of us who maybe are in the boat you were in, like you described, you know, 10 years ago where, hey, we want to love our Shia brothers and sisters. We just don't know much about it. And, um, you know, obviously it's a, it's in, in a sense, our, our Sunni masjids have painted a certain picture. Maybe you could just give us a kind of a, a primer, if you will, on some of the key tenets that, that you were attracted to. Well, I think that at a very fundamental level, uh, to understand that you have to go back to the seerah of the Prophet himself, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When you look at the seerah through through Shi eyes, um, Imam Ali is like absolutely central, and you know to the point where 
you 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 emphasize that when Ali was born, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam held him in his arms. That when Abu Talib was going through a difficult time economically and he needed help with his family, Imam Ali was brought into the home of Sayyida Muhammad, Sayyida Khadija and Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a sort of adopted son. And that when, you know, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called all of his clansmen to tell them about Islam for the first time uh, and asked who will, who will support me, it was only Imam Ali that stood up and said that I will you know, be with you, Ya Rasulullah. Um, and so it's, he's always there and he's the one who buries his blessed body in the ground, right? And, you know, we don't have a tradition, even though we have a tradition in Islamic, you know, history of people going out, there were 10,000 people for his janazah, there were 100,000 people for his janazah. We don't have that for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There was something else going on in Medina that was drawing people's attention, but Imam Ali was stayed with the Prophet's body, it's reported for three days until he was buried finally by him. So his entire life is permeated by the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then, you know, he's married to Sayyidah uh, Fatima and, and, and she is someone who is seen as, you know, sort of an emblem of her father, a symbol of her father, someone who, who is reported in traditions that he said, you know, you know, essentially that when she is angry, I am angry. Um, and, and so, the Shi eyes are fixated so deeply upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through Ali and Fatima and then through their children Hassan and Hussein that there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing like them in the rest of the seerah. And, and so yes, you know, in terms of you find in theological texts, they'll be debating, for example, the meaning of Ghadir Khum, mm -hmm. this event where the, you know, the Prophet sort of to the Shi'is, you know, announces Ali's successorship um, for one final time. It wasn't that it was the only time, but one final time. Uh, you know, but those are those are kind of you know isolated debates about a particular hadith or a particular historical episode. This is a lifetime immersed in in in, in monotheism because Imam Ali was seen to never have been you know persuaded by the the the, the shirk of the Quraysh, uh, and 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 then and and absolute firm conviction in Nabuwa in his in his prophethood um, and so and every you know everyone agrees that if not the the best you know understanding of the Quran was Imam Ali's that at least one of the you know top three or something you know so we're, we're, regardless of which you know sectarian community you're talking about mm -hmm. except maybe the Kharijites I don't know I don't know many Kharijites <laughs> um, but uh, you know the so, so that is really where it starts, and then everything flows from there. Uh -huh. And so, in, in that, for the Shi, the Shi understanding loyalty to the to Imam Ali is loyalty to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this regard. And and everything that you want is with Imam Ali after his passing, right? Like you could sit with him and study Quran for days on days. You could sit with him and study the, the, the Sunnah for days upon days and, and fiqh. And, and he was the master of tasawwuf, of spirituality and everything. And so there's no need to look elsewhere. Um, and if you, if you can't see that perspective, then you'll never understand the rest of Shi tradition. Mm. Um, and so, you know, it, one has to delve into the, the life of Imam Ali and his his teachings in a way that is you know is open to understanding it from multiple standpoints, right? And can embrace the the. I mean, there's so much written about Imam Ali; it is almost you know impossible to encompass in one human lifetime. But you know, you try. And I would say that again, when I visited Najaf in in, in Iraq, and I went to my did my ziyara at Imam Ali's grave, when I sat down to you know pray turakas after that. And I finished, it was like everything I knew about Imam Ali from the moment I became Muslim until that until now like came into my heart and I was just like, This this man is I don't even know where to begin. You know, Wama Adaraka Ma Ali. And you know, what do you know of Ali? 
Um, and, and, and you look at the Shi scholars, they talk about that way about Imam Ali. Like, you know, we don't even know who he is, right? He's, he's just somebody else. So I think that that is, that is the root. And then, I, and then you, you build from that. From I really, really appreciate that distinction or, or that, or, or, or for you to root us there, because I think the centrality and then thereby the fidelity to Sayyidina Ali um, it becomes not only, uh, I think, where there's uh, er, points of confluence in, in, in between the Shi and Sunni tradition, but then also that, ironically enough, serve as the kind of defining points of, dis you know, points of departure which is the centrality and the fidelity to Sayyidina Ali. And what I mean by that is this, is that when we examine the, even within the Sunni tradition, I, and again, I'm, I'm perhaps being a little, uh, I'm, I'm not painting with as fine of a, of a brush in, in broad strokes, but I think one could surmise that, you know, when you talk about within even the Ahl al-Sunnah with Jama'ah, uh, or let's just say the Sunni, because Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah then becomes well, you know, this group claims to be Ahl Sunnah, this other group doesn't, and so on. But uh, within the Sunni tradition, um, it is it is in the it is in the contemplative and the areas of the Sawwuf where we find, I would argue, foremost that centrality of Sayyidina Ali. Otherwise, it's just sort of like he's just another figure in the Sira. He is yet another one of the many constellations of the that were surrounding the prophet, right? That's often the narrative. Whereas I think if you look at the in the spiritual tradition of Sunni, of Sunnism, which is let's say the Sawwuf, is where you really begin a serious and contemplative approach. And I would argue the that that sort of fidelity to Sayyidina Ali. Um, and so maybe talk a little bit about that, or if you will, or if you agree with that. And then I think then to me, why I find also that, why I found it interesting that you rooted us in Sayyidina Ali is because, and again, this is just me reading into this. So you can again, agree or disagree. Actually, you know what? I'll put a pin in that card. I'll put a pin in that question and I'll come back to it because I don't want you to have to sort of react to two both separate things. So I'll come back to my second question. So why don't you maybe kind of reflect on what I just said in terms of the first first question and maybe respond to it. And then I'll ask my second question, which is related to that. Yeah, I mean, the Sufi tradition, as many people know, there you go, sorry, you know, call it, has, call it that. Mm -hmm. has, you know, this concept of a, a lineage, a spiritual lineage, which is sort of tied in with the concept of an Isnad, but is sort of distinct from it as well. Mm -hmm. And pretty much every Sufi, you know, lineage goes back to Imam Ali um, or claims to go back to Imam Ali. Correct. With the exception of the Naqshbandis um, who claim to go back to Abu Bakr through this thing called the Uwaisi transmission, but that's for a whole nother podcast and for some Naqshbandi scholar to talk about. Um, okay. And the, you know, reality is that the Sufi and the Shi traditions overlap in so many ways. And this is really, in my opinion, as it's not something you can prove, you know, this is a very much an opinion. So someone could take issue with this, but that is why the Wahhabis have so much venom for both the Sufis and the Shis, right? Is they see that. And it's very sad to me when, you know, those who have that love for the Ahlul Bayt and have, you know, that you know, love for Imam Ali and that understanding of his spiritual stature kowtow to the Wahhabis, you know, for the sake of usually just some sort of political unity, right, um, you know, in, in the Gulf, right? So they, they will defend Saudi Arabia, they will defend the Emirates, and they will defend, you know, this thing because they're afraid, you know, of, of the Shis, you know, that are suppressed in places like Bahrain, um, in places like Eastern Saudi Arabia, and, uh, you know, and and have so many restrictions placed upon them, and they recognize that there's such an overlap, um, and and so you know that 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 frustration that the Sufis feel with with you know the the Wahhabis is very similar to the frustration that the um, you know Shis feel, uh, you know, but the 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 way you look at it can be very you know. 
different for different people. So for example, I met this old white convert who is a shadowy muqaddam of a sheikh in, in Egypt. And when his sheikh died, he was like, well, where do I go for spiritual sustenance now? And he essentially, you know, became a believer in the Shi understanding of Imamat. Um, and that, you know, it begins with Imam Ali and it ends with Imam Mahdi. And that, but he just, he continued to follow Sunni fiqh because that's what he'd been practicing his whole life. Um, and I asked, I asked him, I said, well, what about this whole idea of the Qutb, you know, that's so central to more metaphysical Sufism? He said, well, you know, this <laughs> is amazing to me. I was just, he said, the, the Sufis that have grown spiritually enough cannot deny the idea of a central spiritual authority in Islam. But they're so afraid of Shiism that they can't see it. And so they, they created this thing called the Qutb, which is basically the Imam, right? And then they, but they never tell you who it is. So it could be the Shaykh, it could be that Shaykh, who nobody really knows. But he's the spiritual center of, of the Muslim Ummah because they didn't want to believe in Imamit, right? And it was because that was Shiism. That's mm. the Shaykh. You know, mm. and so they'll accept that Imam Ali was the Imam, or they'll trace their lineage back through Imam Al Hassan. They may even talk about Imam Al Sadiq, the sixth Imam, or Imam Al Qadim, the seventh Imam, right? But then, you know, and then they'll talk about how you know the the Imam Mahdi is from Ahlul Bayt, right? But then they won't ever want to make that link, right? And they don't want, they don't want ever to believe that there's actually like a coherent theology behind it, which says that yes, when Imam Ali. He was the Qutb, the Imam, whatever you want to call him. And, you know, it was to everyone's spiritual benefit to orient themselves towards him. You know, uh, I don't want to. So. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that. And I don't want to do a disservice because I, and I think that the only solution that I can come up with is, you know, inshallah, we're going to have another episode that follows uh, at some point and where we're going to really get into, I think, the tradition of Shiism proper. Um, and David, whether that's with you or someone else, I mean, right, we'll, we'll see about scheduling, but I, I want to make a promise to our listeners that we do that uh, because I, I'm fascinated and I feel like I said, I, I, I don't want to do injustice to it. But in the brief time, in the very, very brief time that we have left with you and because you've already, you know, because we're, we're, we're talking about the centrality and again, fidelity to Sayyidina Ali, um, I want you, you know, and which was the second question that I wanted to ask, and, and it's interesting what you just mentioned about the Khadim and 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 the, that idea and the concept of that within the Sawaf or within the Sunni, uh, the Sunni uh, Sufi tradition, is that the way I read the way I read the sort of again uh, sort of how do I say it, big picture differences between Sunnism and Shiism is this. And this is why I say the centrality of Sayyidina Ali is that if we believe in the infallibility of the Prophet, peace be upon him, Prophet Muhammad, and we all do, and that's something that I mean is is is, is you know is is agreed upon. It is an article of faith. You cannot be Muslim without agreeing uh, on the isma or the infallibility of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Now the question then arises is well, what then happens? You know. Uh, when the prophet returns to his lord like what happens when the prophet dies what happens to that infallibility and here again this is just my reading of history and theology and 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 very kind of as i said big picture not you know and and, and i apologize if it's not nuanced is that the, the Sunni approach to understanding that isma or that infallibility of the prophet is that it becomes infused within the jama'ah, hence Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. It becomes infused within the community. And that's amorphous and that really, you know, there's a lot to discuss there and unpack there. To, in the Shi tradition, it it passes or it, it is infused, if you will, through the through Ahlul Bayt, through the bloodline of the Prophet, peace be upon him, but primarily uh, the bloodline as it is conveyed and transmitted uh, with uh, Bibi Fatima, uh, uh, Sayyidina Fatima, uh, Sayyidina Fatima, and Sayyidina Ali. And so would you agree with that assessment? Again, kind of big picture, lacking nuance, but maybe kind of a broad you know, point of departure between Sunnism and Shiism. That's definitely an element of it. Okay. Um, but I think it's really important that we 
couch these things in terms that are meaningful for us. Please. So I'll just say how I understand it. Um, and, you know, again, that this is me just trying to figure things out to the best of my ability. I actually believe in a sort of combination of the two. Okay. So as you might know, Dr. Jackson, you know, had this concept. I don't know if he's published it somewhere, but it's been used often in our community of the private minimum, public maximum. Right. So then our tradition, we have this idea that there's certain things that everyone has to know and do. And there are other things that, you know, you can kind of spend your lifetime focusing on and rising in ranks of excellence. But there's something you do in private as an individual. They're not obligatory upon all the people. For me, that concept of the Jama'ah is kind of like that public minimum. And this is part of the teachings of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, is to honor the Jama'ah, the Muslim Ummah, to hope good for the Muslim Ummah, to recognize the value in you know, everyone who says, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, and the ways in which they carry the kind of broad contours of Islam throughout history. Um, so there's not like, oh, we're, we're so mad that, you know, I don't know, Malaysia became Muslim at the hands of Sunnis and not Shis or something like that. No, right? For everyone who has spread Islam and history to the best of their ability, may Allah reward them. And, you know, for all my teachers who I got in the past, you know, that taught me the basics of prayer and of reading the Quran and so on and so forth, those things were transmitted to me from the Prophet وسلم, through innumerable ways, right? And this idea of the Jama'ah, like, I mean, so many ways I could recount all these immigrants from India who came and just wanted to build institutions or publish books or some person that went abroad and studied and came back and taught these different, you know, sciences of, of Islamic tradition. But then the private maximum is the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. They're the center of our tradition. And so that's what's, that's what's exposed on Ashura. So there were hundreds of masjids, you know, in the Muslim Ummah at that time. There were hundreds of thousands of Muslims, right? But the center of Islam in that day was Imam Hussein. And the people, the you know, approximately 130 people that were gathered around to protect him. And, you know, that doesn't mean that the new convert somewhere over in Egypt on that day wasn't beloved by God and didn't, wasn't going to grow in their faith. They didn't even know it was happening, perhaps, right? And so what they were learning of the religion of Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, pray towards Mecca, fast in the month of Ramadan, that was all well and good and valid. But the heart of our faith, the heart of our community was with Imam Hussein on Ashura. And that's why that story is so central, because it then centers us into the full and complete expression of Islam, that if you aren't willing to, to move towards, you'll find a, a thousand excuses to why you don't have to, right? And so Imam Hussein was left alone on that day, ultimately, when the, the 20,000 or 30,000 soldiers on the other side had killed his family and his companions before him, and now he had to sacrifice his own life. And he's wondering, where is everybody? All these people that have claimed to be in love with my grandfather, who used to let me ride on his back and carry me on his shoulders. Where are they this day? Right. And so for me as a Muslim, whatever else I may be, may I be someone who is from the Ansar of Imam Hussein, from the supporters. And may we all be. Oh, I think that when you understand that story, if you're Muslim, you cannot imagine that you wouldn't want to be somebody who was there on that day. And you could have honored and expressed your love for your prophet through defending his grandson. So... Thank you, David. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Thank you um, so much, so much. I, um, you know, I, for me, I, my my favorite episodes on this podcast have always been the ones that I, what I identify as kind of in this sort of intimate, you know, conversation and a long form conversation. And so, I, I feel like we've achieved that in spades you know, this morning or this afternoon. So thank you so much for taking the time to do that. Um, thank you uh, so much for having me. I really, I really, no, no, it. It, it really means a lot to us, David. And, and, and I, and what I want to say to the listeners is I hope that until we have that subsequent follow-up episode or whatever that looks like, you know, I hope that this sort of began an inquiry within you to sort of examine, you know, your analysis and where you find yourself with all of this and, and how you really make sense of all of this in, in the, in the kind of way that I think, 
David has so uniquely and beautifully uh, kind of uh, kind of uh, exposed to us as well as led us through. So again, thank you really. I mean that sincerely. Um, David, before I before we wrap, I, 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 I want to allow our listeners the opportunity to kind of engage you, your writings, uh, some of your reflections. I know you have like kind of a blog, a website. Uh, please do plug that. If there's any social media presence that you have where people can engage you, uh, please do so. Yeah, so I have a book available on Amazon in both paperback and Kindle, uh, which is really meant to explain Islam at its most basic foundations from from my viewpoint. And I actually wrote it uh, specifically for people who maybe are in a relationship with a person of another worldview and want to give them something to help them maybe see that Islam would be a choice for them. Um, and it's called uh, The Beautiful Surrender. And uh, Islam is a path to be walked. And you, if you type in R, which is you know short for Robert, my first name, R. David Coolidge into the Amazon search, it'll show up. Or you can type in The Beautiful Surrender. I think there's also some sort of romance novel called The Beautiful Surrender. So that might be your first, first thing you see. Uh, but that's not my book. That's not I'm my looking book. at it right now on the Amazon site. Um, we'll make sure to link to it. Thank you so much, David, for that. And then as far as, uh, I, I, again, I, I know having followed your writings elsewhere, um, you do have another site as well, correct? Or, or? I have, I've, I've been having a blog since 2008 called A Mercy Case, A Mercy Case. Dot com, um, out of the recognition that I'm just a seeker after my Lord's mercy at the end of the day. Thank you so much, David. And just echoing what Prabhu said, uh, you and I haven't met, but I, I really appreciate you sharing everything. And, and I do hope to meet you uh, soon in person. Inshallah. So to our listeners, I uh, hope you benefit from this uh, as much as we did. And uh, keep looking for future episodes. We'll be back uh, in the interim. Contact us. Um, leave us a review. And uh, definitely keep supporting us through Patreon. Every bit of support helps. Uh, until then, be safe and inshallah, take care. We'll see you soon. Salam alaikum. <laughs>